Just 45 minutes after Peter de Vries was shot in the middle of Amsterdam, the police had already caught the alleged assassins. They were hopelessly lost, with no chance of escape, and had been left behind by the criminal organization that they were once so eager to work for. In the immediate aftermath of his murder, it becomes clear just how ill-prepared the gang has been. While Delano is euphoric that de Vries is lying dead in the street and thinks he is about to receive the payday of a lifetime, his handler on the other end of the Google Pixel phone is beginning to panic. The plan they've been working on for weeks is now a reality, and he soon realizes how quickly the net is closing. The handler repeats that the pair must set fire to the getaway car and their clothing and throw away the license plates and the murder weapon. However, he has not yet arranged a second car to which the men can transfer. Unbelievably, he texts the assassins in mid-getaway, I'm going to fix the car in a minute. There is no hiding place. The communication ends in chaos. The handler keeps repeating that Camille and Delano must stop the car, set it on fire, and walk away from the scene. In a final act of desperation, he demands that Camille breaks the Google Pixel in half and swallow the SIM card. Load that big one, he writes frantically, apparently referring to the submachine gun hidden in the trunk. But Delano is rightly afraid that the police will shoot. Dutch police then arrest the two men. Both men will be taken to court and a trial will begin. The case is given the code name Iraklia. However, there is a huge twist as the case nears a conclusion when a witness comes forward with sensational new information. The witness reveals the involvement of up to four other individuals and takes the investigation to a new level. A separate case is opened and is given the code name Hendon. After some time, Dutch detectives decide to merge the two cases. This video will highlight some of the revelations this witness has provided to the police that have rocked the Dutch underworld to its core. November 2nd, 2021, in The Hague, Netherlands. Two detectives, a Polish interpreter and a witness, are sitting in an interrogation room at just before half past six in the evening. For the sake of his safety, he is presented as witness 5089, or under the pseudonym Eddie. He turned himself into the police in October 2021, after his criminal friends ordered him to participate in the kidnapping of two children of a drug dealer. He didn't want to, but refusing was dangerous. After approaching a community police officer in Ter R, he indicated that he had some high-level confidential information. The criminal intelligence team of The Hague is then mobilized to take his statement. He was quoted as saying, I decided for myself. To get out, I have to report to the police. The kidnapping was prevented and arrests were made. Soon after, five men showed up at Eddie's door with weapons. They demanded 100,000 euros. They could kill me because of everything I know about them. I'm like a mouse in its hole for now. I'm really, really scared. Eddie explains that the whole situation is regarding the murdered journalist, Peter de Vries. When asked if he can say in his own words what he knows about the murder, he gets straight to the point. Christian was looking for a man for his uncle from April. He calls him his uncle. It is a Moroccan man for whom Christian works, says Eddie. He was looking for someone to shoot a journalist. The reason was that he was working together with a key witness. He said that they shot the brother of the key witness for this, and now it is his turn. The following month, Christian told Eddie that he had found someone who would further observe de Vries and eventually pull the trigger. That was the fellow Pole, Kamil Egiert, whom Eddie had met through Christian in April 2021 and was friendly with. They nicknamed him Grubs, which referred to him being slightly overweight. He went on to reveal that Camille was a bit of a hustler with financial problems and had recently stolen a batch of drugs with Christian. After accepting the assassination order, Camille is said to have become frightened and suggests that he wants to withdraw. For example, he said that he had lost the gun with which he had to shoot de Vries because the police had confiscated it from his car. Christian assumed that Camille was afraid and made up excuses and must have sold the weapon somewhere. He would find another. According to Eddie, that would have been against the wishes of Christian's client. The Moroccan man had allegedly said, if Camille does not want to shoot, he should at least drive. If he does not want to, he must be shot because it has already gone too far. He already knew too much. Eddie went on to explain that when he spoke to Christian on the next occasion, in early June, he revealed that he had hired Delano. Christian had said, 
Yeah, he's definitely going to do it, even in broad daylight. And that Camille is going to take him there, because too much has already been invested in him. It was confirmed that 150,000 euros would be paid for the murder of De Vries. 100,000 euros for the shooter and 50,000 euros for the driver. Camille's pregnant fiancé would receive his wages, albeit only 45,000 euros were eventually handed over. 5,000 euros had been withheld because of the missing weapon. Eddie did not hear about the assassination attempt on De Vries until a day later at work, where he saw it in the morning news. The next day, Christian came to see him. He seemed pleased that the attack had taken place, but angry that Camille and Delano had been arrested, and also because Camille had allegedly failed to act on instructions and had taken a different escape route than initially agreed. After the assassination attempt, Christian left for Poland for four weeks, fearing that Camille would make statements. It was suggested that if Camille did talk, there were plans made to kill his mother. According to Eddie, the order for the hit on De Vries came from the man that Christian calls uncle. Christian was deeply impressed by this man. Everyone was afraid of him. Eddie told detectives, he once explained to me who the uncle is, that it is someone who killed the key witness's brother and lawyer. Since the uncle is in prison, his brother is his extension outside. He is the chief. He gives orders to the soldiers every day. Christian was allegedly the leader of the Polish soldiers. Christian was eventually arrested while already in a jail cell. He was detained because of his suspected role in a failed liquidation in Zewolda. He was also a co-defendant of Anuar Tagi, cousin of Ridwan Tagi, in a case against a gang that allegedly stole cars to use in underworld murders, such as the vehicles used to mobilize the killers of Dirk Wiersum and Redwan Bakali, lawyer and brother of Crown Witness Nabil Bakali in the Marengo trial. Christian came to live in the Netherlands with his parents from his native Poland at a young age. He lived in a small town called Ochten, in a small terraced house, and had a normal upbringing. As he grew older, Christian slides further away from what is considered an honest living. Eddie tells detectives that he lives with three friends in an apartment on Midachtenweg in Rotterdam. Eddie claims that it is within this apartment that the Poles plot their next moves within the Dutch underworld. Another man suspected of being part of the Polish cell is 30-year-old Conrad W. He is said to have moved to the Netherlands at a young age, where he has accumulated a criminal record for drug possession, traffic accidents, and car theft. In 2020, he would have been convicted of assault in Poland. In the Netherlands, he worked as a loader and unloader of trucks. At the time of the murder of Peter de Vries, he was living in Rotterdam. It is alleged that he moved the murder weapon from a secret storage facility on Alphen Arn den Rien to the vehicle used by the killers. The prosecutors also see plenty of evidence against two Antillian men, Ericsson O and Geroa M. In short, their involvement consists of their preliminary reconnaissance and the following and filming of Peter de Vries. In leaked messages, Ericsson spoke of performing an observation while waiting with Geroa in a McDonald's restaurant near the back exit of the RTL Boulevard studio. On the day of the attack on de Vries, they drove from Rotterdam to Amsterdam in the silver-grey Peugeot in which traces of their DNA were found. The pair sat for 45 minutes at a table in the McDonald's with a view of the rear exit of the RTL Boulevard studio. When de Vries had come out, they went through the emergency exit of the McDonald's after him. After the attack, they stood next to de Vries, but offered no help. CCTV footage shows that they were busy with their mobile phones. According to Justice, the shocking images of de Vries that appeared on social media were demonstrably made by Geroa. Ericsson had reported to the police himself in August 2021 after recognizing himself in the images of the men in the Lange Leidsedvorstraat. He lied during interrogations that he had come to Amsterdam alone. According to the judiciary, he lived with Geroa and another man, Christopher W., in a house in Delfzeel. On January 14th, 2022, Ericsson O said in a taped conversation that they were under orders to watch that street and they were there for the sixth time on the day of the killing. Ericsson mentioned Targi as the client in that conversation and that he would get money for that. It is likely they will face severe punishment for their role, even though they did not put their hands on any weapons or pull a trigger. 
The Dutch state considers filming such a public execution and posting it online as an act of terrorism, designed to instill fear into the hearts of the nation. Their actions after the attack don't suggest innocence either. Both men immediately left the country. After careful analysis of their movements, police arrested Ericsson in Spain, while Geroa was picked up in the Dutch Antilles. Interestingly, since the two cases were merged and the investigation has developed, detectives have discovered that this is not the only link between Dutch and Polish criminals. It would seem that the witness, Eddie, did not only reveal information about the actions of Christian and Conrad, it now appears that partly on the basis of his statements, a third investigation, 26 Waltz, is also underway into a Polish-Dutch crime group. The focus is on 22-year-old Jordan van der Es from Teal, who is described by the Public Prosecution Service as a murder broker. According to the judiciary, he assisted Christian in supplying the weapons used in the attack on de Vries. Van der Es is said to have directed the group from Amersfoort in committing various attacks on rivals and is said to be involved in an assassination attempt in the Dominican Republic. He is also said to have directed the criminal organization in the arms trade after the police raid on the shed in Alphen and Doreen. This raid results in the discovery of 22 small arms, 22 automatic guns and four anti-tank guns. Dutch police seem to have finally broken down this Dutch-Polish crime cell that had offered their hit for higher services to the Moroccan Mafia. It is a case that continues to fascinate nationally and abroad as the public observes the court process closely. Whilst not unusual for criminal gangs to merge to commit offences, the victim, Peter de Vries, was about as high profile as you can get. The court case has taken many twists and turns, but looks set for a conclusion near the end of 2023. The people of the Netherlands watch on and hope that justice prevails, not only for Peter, but also for his grieving family who have waited so long for this moment. You have been watching OCG TV. Thanks for watching another episode, and keep your eye on our channel for an incredible story coming out of the Irish underworld, coming very soon. As always, it would really help the channel if you could like this video and subscribe if you haven't already.